This is Black Focus, an open discussion where we talk everything politics, current events, and academic scholarship through the lenses of race, gender, and class. We intend to raise awareness on social justice issues pertinent to the intellectuals of our time and ask that you join us for this conversation. Hello, 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 and welcome. I'm your co-host, Kenya Harris. And I'm your other co-host, She. And this is Black Focus, an open discussion where we aim to educate the masses, address social justice issues, and liberate the exploited through resourcing. Yes, so today we have our very first and special participant. Helmi is along for the ride today and is here for the conversation. Now, Helmi is a longtime activist who has participated in direct practice and advocacy surrounding mental health, healthcare access, and reproductive justice, especially expanding abortion access. She was the co-founder of Yellow Hammer Fund, Alabama Statewide Reproductive Justice Fund, and was the chair of the West Alabama Clinic Defenders for three years, the clinic escort group for the West Alabama Women's Center in Tuscaloosa, one of only three, that's right, three abortion clinics in Alabama. Currently, she is pursuing her master's in social work at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis, and she's specializing in child mental health, but she is also still advocating and active in the local and statewide and national reproductive justice community and conversation. So everyone, welcome Helmi. Snap it up, snap it up. (laughs) We love a sister of substance. We just love a sister of substance. Like (laughs) I am so excited to be in the presence of such a queen, such a woman that empowers the community and also gives a voice to people that are exploited. I so appreciate that. That's so sweet of you to say. Of course, girl, we got your back because we know you got our <laughs> sister's bags. No, yeah, she is definitely a queen of substance. And we're going to be discussing a whole lot of substance in today's conversation, which is talking about abortion access, reproductive justice, and framing it in terms of the Amy Coney Barrett gearings and just giving a general understanding consensus of the general information that people should know when they're talking about abortion access and reproductive justice. Let's get started with the first question, which is, who is Amy Coney Barrett? What parts of her professional career and history are relevant to today's conversation? And how is that relevant to the hearings? What are her credentials? What do we need to know about her to make an informed opinion? Do you want to go first, Helmi? Yeah, so Amy Coney Barrett is the latest confirmed Supreme Court justice. She was nominated by President Trump. And her record and her credentials are notable for several reasons, one of which, which I know we will get further into, is because of how conservative her views are. In some areas, she is more conservative than the Pope, which is kind of saying something. And... You know, she also has very little experience as a judge compared to most people who are considered for Supreme Court justices. She was only appointed to be a judge on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in 2017. She also was a professor at Notre Dame Law School, which is one of the ways we know some of her views because of the law review she wrote there. But Yeah, so she's a very controversial pick for many reasons, most notably so that she is so inexperienced in that she has such extremist view on um, many issues, many of which are civil rights issues, and many of which are very relevant issues in terms of cases that the Supreme Court is about to hear and could hear in the very near future. Exactly. And I just want to touch on a few of the things that you were talking about of her very little expertise that's going on in the field of the 
federal circuit court. She's only been on the federal circuit court for three years. And within that time, she has ruled twice against abortion access and abortion rights and commissioner of Indiana State Department of Health versus Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky Incorporated, and then also in Fox v. Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky Incorporated. The one time that she did rule somewhat in favor of abortion rights, I don't even know if you could actually call it that, was in Price v. City of Chicago, where she basically just said that she was barring anti-abortion demonstrators from approaching citizens who were seeking the services of abortion clinics. So I feel like that's kind of the least amount of work that she could have done for people seeing as those demonstrators, and you could probably speak to this, are very hostile. Yes, definitely. As a clinic escort and as the leader of a clinic escort program, I am intimately familiar with at least at my clinic in Tuscaloosa, you know, the politics and dynamics between protesters and staff, patients, companions, and of course, escorts. At every clinic, it's a little bit different. It kind of depends on, you know, the location of the clinic, the physical structure of the clinic, you know, where the public right of way starts, where private property ends. And also, it depends on what anti-abortion groups are either in the nearby area or feel compelled to drive up to those clinics. In Tuscaloosa, generally, our protesters are, you know, locals. They have been going to the clinic for years. And like at many clinics, there's a spectrum. So there are some who we like to call sidewalk grandmas or sidewalk counselors. And their whole MO is to try and and manipulate people into going over there. They hold these goodie bags that um, they call blessing bags, which have like soap, pamphlets about inaccurate medical information, sometimes candy, hand sanitizer, random stuff like that. And when you get over there, they will try and manipulate you into changing your mind by, you know, making promises they can't keep about paying for your rent, your cable, your car, your health insurance, your target runs by telling people inaccurate information about, you know, the development of fetuses and kind of fear mongering stuff like that. And then, of course, you have the other end of the spectrum, which is kind of more what Chicago was dealing with in this case, which are, you know, the people who are really loud, really aggressive. They have the most graphic signs and they are, you know, just so aggressively loud and harassed. They say all kinds of things. A lot of times it's religiously based. You know, I've been told that I'm going to burn eternally for each baby I've ushered to slaughter. You know, they'll make personal attacks about escorts, patients, and companions. They'll pick out something they notice about the, you know, patient or companion. They also make a lot of racist remarks. So, you know, if Black Lives Matter, how come millions of Black babies die? Or, like, especially in Tuscaloosa, if they saw a large Black man, they would say things like, You know, your baby could be playing basketball or football at Alabama one day. Just really uncomfortable stuff like that. And then, of course, there's people in the middle. You know, you have you have some groups who just kind of go to the clinic and they pray. It's really important to them to pray. And then maybe they leave or they kind of sit there with their sign. Um, But I have also been the victim of literal violence. There's some protesters who get really aggressive and, you know, cross onto the property line and have pushed me, have pushed my fellow escorts. And in May of 2019, right before the ban passed, there was this guy who drove into the clinic parking lot and he had done this several times before and threatened to hit escorts. And he reversed his car into my es- my friend while she was standing right next to me. And the only reason I didn't get hit is because I was able to jump out of the way in time. So, yeah, these, uh, like, these protesters, you know, no matter where on the spectrum of outward violence and aggression they show, they are really dangerous. They make 
patients cry, they make companions cry, they make people really uncomfortable. That's part of the whole reason that clinic escorts exist, are to walk patients in and to and from the clinic to protect them, to distract them from the harassment. At my clinic where I work at now in St. Louis, it's actually across the river in Granite City, Illinois. And at that clinic, the clinic has their own parking lot where the protesters can't come, but the back parking lot is completely up for grabs. So it's basically a race. I mean, you don't want to run toward a patient and it makes them uncomfortable, but if escorts don't get there first, the antis are not afraid to like go right up to the car and, you know, not let that person out or just, you know, try and hand them stuff, try and yell at them. And when I have been walking patients to the clinic from that back parking lot, I have been physically pushed as well. And another really important part about escorting is you do not engage whatsoever. Very few escort programs do engage. That also depends on the clinic's dynamics and things. But in general, it's not really worth it to talk to these antis, you're not going to change each other's minds. It's just going to increase tensions, which is just bad for everybody, you know, but they really do try. They'll pick out, you know, specific things about these patients and companions. They'll pick out specific things about escorts. So every once in a while, a case like that goes to a court, whether it's at the federal, state, or city level. People try and get buffer zones for their clinics, so there's areas that the protesters can't go into. They try and build fences around their clinics. So each of those cases is really important because it sets precedent for the next one. And, you know, ultimately, escorts, staff, patients, companions deserve to be protected. There's federal legislation called the FACE Act, where you're not allowed to interfere with people seeking reproductive health services or going to places of worship. But depending on where you live, law enforcement does or doesn't enforce that very well. So Yes. I think listening to all this, I was I learned a lot, like even just so early on from you. But like I was so shocked. I think the biggest feeling for me is shock that people are doing all of this just on something that doesn't affect them, like them having that baby, they don't have to take that responsibility. And though you might have children and you're able to handle that responsibility, that doesn't mean that everybody else can. And so why are we now trying to influence somebody's choice, which means that's something that them and God have to deal with if they choose to, you know, believe in God. But at the end of the day, that's their choice. But another reason why I was shocked is because it's just shocking that, Barrett got into her. She had the quickest um, hearing ever. Like it was only four weeks. And so to me, I was so shocked by that because I'm like, in any other um, confirmation hearing, we've seen it being prolonged. We've seen during um, Barack Obama's administration before his uh, next term, a lot of Republicans were pressuring him or making it a very much political a political topic in the media about how it would be wrong for him to nominate anybody. And that was months way before the election. And so I just find it so shocking that we see this precedent that Republicans have set themselves to where when it's on their agenda, it's fine for them to break the rules and it's fine for them to do whatever they want in order to get their mandate through. But when it's the Democrats, they need to play by their rules or they need to go by earlier precedents or just have so-called decency. So when do we stop, you know, as people who are independents or even if you are Democrats, when do we stop and actually call out those who are basically just being bullies on the playground that like when they get pushed down or they get hit, it's a problem. But when they do the hitting and beating up of the people, then it's okay. That's also a topic that people really should be thinking about when they're going into this election, even though it is just tomorrow. Just getting in politics in general, we need to make sure that we spot these problems and we and we spot these injustices and we actually sit there and really think about them. So I want to move on. I really want to move on now to the next question, even though you really gave us some really good stuff. <laughs> it, was juicy. it was really juicy. Um, but I want to talk about 
Do you feel as though like people are scared about Amy Coney Barrett's overturning Roe v. Wade and reproductive rights being under attack? Is this a valid feeling or have reproductive rights are are have they already been under attack? So I think that it's undeniable that the Trump administration has further empowered anti-abortion legislators um, in state assemblies throughout the country to enact more abortion bans that they would not have tried previously, such as these six-week bans, since they feel like Trump has stacked the courts, you know, the lower courts in their favor, and these lower courts will uphold these restrictions. But I think it's also important to realize that since 1973, over 1,200 abortion restrictions have been introduced, and even between 2014 and 2019 alone, over 200 restrictions have been enacted. So I see a lot of valid concern that, you know, if a case comes that calls Roe into question, Amy Coney Barrett could be part of the conservative majority that overturns it, and the right to an abortion is no longer constitutionally protected but, you know, the, I'd say the majority of the country already lives in a post row world where I can count the number of clinics that a state has with one hand, where there are other barriers such as cost, needing to find transportation, child care, or even lodging, depending on, you know, the waiting period laws or how far away it is, which make abortion inaccessible already, especially for low-income people Black people, and other people of color. And so federally, there has been legislation such as the Women's Health Protection Act, which has been introduced for many years in a row. What that law would do is that it would repeal a whole range of abortion restrictions, prohibit them from being passed in the future, and give the Department of Justice extra power to take legal action against legislatures that try to enact them. And so protecting Roe is what, you know, you hear Biden, all these legislators, political pundits and stuff talking about. What people don't realize is that is the absolute floor, and we need to be doing more to protect against all these other hundreds of types of restrictions that have already been enacted and introduced and prevent them from being further legitimized. For our listeners who don't know what the qualification for those restrictions are, those are called targeted regulation of abortion provider laws, trap laws. And those laws do work in order to, like you just said, limit the access of abortion to large groups of people. And a lot of those regulations, like you talked about, are doing things like having clinics to be up to the same standards as ambulatory services, for instance, like you talked about. And a new study from the Advancing New Standards and Reproductive Health Research came out and said that their conclusions were these were unnecessary infrastructures and the structuring had no relation to the safety of abortions and that it was honestly irrelevant to the whole procedure at large. So just like you said, it's another way for states to try to limit access and try to restrict the work that these clinics are doing. And I know Alabama had a few types of different legislation, but the one that I remember most intimately is Amendment 2. And I know you do because we worked on that one together, which was recognizing the sanctity of the unborn child. And that was just a whole lot of hoopla for a lot of reasons. I remember in reading like the text of the legislation They had alluded to it being the Holocaust and to the Rwandan genocide. And it even gave grounds for a man to file a wrongful death suit against the Alabama clinic and his girlfriend who got an abortion, which is just absolutely insane to me. And that's why these types of things are super harmful to people. And that's why we're having this conversation. We have to also look how... If Barrett does overturn Roe v. Wade, that we're going to see a significant decrease in 
health services as far as preventive preventive health care because these are essential preventive health care methods and tools for women that they can get but it's also just as equally important as hiv testing and hiv prevention and i think that a lot of people don't understand is if they do strike this down it opens Basically, it opens up the conservatives to take down a lot of public health programs and initiative because the first thing they're going to do is starting to defund social programs and they're going to give a lot of red states. They're going to give these people in power, basically give them the power to take away a lot of this funding. So it's not just anti-abortion. It's really like anti like healthcare really and people don't see how that's really going to mess a lot of people up and they don't see that it's also going to in- increase a lot of contraction of a lot of diseases and and I'm thinking specifically from my background STD um and HIV because if we don't have those testings people are not going to you know go and get them because they can't because it would be really hard because those tests are expensive and a lot of um insurance companies that I see this happening, they're going to follow behind these policies because it's going to be a better way for them to make money. Because if they do not now have to invest in preventive care, they can maximize on basically not having that cost anymore. And so it's honestly such a big precedent that really needs to stick. With that being said, let's move on to the next question. Um, Helmy, I want to know, what are some common misconceptions about the Amy Coney Barrett hearings? What are some things that activists like you were originally thinking about when she was confirmed? Like, was this new? Could you give us a little bit more information about that? Yeah, honestly, you know, Trump has had his shortlist throughout his administration for who he would put on the Supreme Court. And, you know, the Trump administration has made it clear, as well as many, um, legislators in the senate which confirm all the judges that they won't approve of anybody who thinks that roe v wade is you know legitimate so we as repro activists honestly expected amy coney barrett to some of us instead of kavanaugh because she was on that short list we knew the whole time and considering that the trump administration has made their intent to decimate abortion access clear and they've already demonstrated their commitment to that objective through policies like y'all were just talking about restricting other types of preventive care preventative care reproductive health care you know funding and programs through what's known as the gag rule which was already instituted internationally but now it's also domestically which prohibits title 10 clinics which are clinics who receive funding to provide reproductive health services from receiving funding if they provide abortions or even provide referrals to abortion services. So that, you know, Planned Parenthood had to opt out of Title X. A bunch of independent clinics had to opt out of Title X. A whole bunch of, you know, Title X's program was diminished substantially. So, yeah, I just feel like Another thing having to do with, you know, the judicial process is that the Trump administration has already appointed and confirmed hundreds of extremist anti-abortion judges to these lower courts. These lower courts have a lot more power than I think the average person realizes because it's not like these bans are passed and then automatically SCOTUS gets to hear them. It first has to go through lower courts, whether it's the state Supreme Court or these federal courts, you know, luckily in some places in Alabama, we have Judge Myron Thompson, who is generally pretty friendly toward reproductive rights. But, you know, if a court rules already that these abortion restrictions are okay, then that precedent is there for when it goes up to the Supreme Court. So that's what we saw this summer with June versus Russo, which was a hospital admitting privileges law, which Texas had passed a similar one in 2016 that made it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided that it was unconstitutional. However, the only thing that had changed between that Supreme Court case and June versus Russo is the makeup of the court. So we were really scared that 
it would be upheld, but it ended up not being upheld. Luckily, well, it was de- deemed unconstitutional again. But John Roberts, he created his own decision based on that. And a lot of people saw that decision as like, oh, he's telling people to stick to Roe. But really, it was just saying, you know, I voted against this law because there's precedent. But, you know, other abortion restrictions are fair game. So in Arkansas this summer, a whole slew of abortion restrictions were deemed constitutional and allowed to be upheld until you know, if they decide to appeal it further, because people think of Roe, but in 1992, there was this case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And basically what this case did is it created this new standard of undue burden, because Roe had created a standard of no restrictions till viability, but with this undue burden, Abortion restrictions are okay as long as it doesn't provide an undue burden on the pregnant person. So as you can imagine, anti-abortion legislators ran with that and came up with all kinds of stuff. Like you talked about, the structural standards for a clinic when abortion is one of the safest procedures in the U.S. You know, fear-mongering, state-mandated counseling, forcing people to wait 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours in between their first and second appointments. Just ridiculous stuff like that that, you know, that's how it remains inaccessible. So there's varying opinions on how abortion access will continue to be decimated on the judicial level. And some people think that Roe will just be overturned. Some case will some case will come that will challenge Roe directly and the Supreme Court will take the opportunity to just ban abortion outright. While other people believe that it'll just be more about the individual restrictions being deemed constitutional and further empowering these anti-abortion legislators to uphold them or pass them. Say that I'm still a listener and I'm like, okay, like I still don't understand Roe v. Wade and I'm still like needing more relevant cases of legislation what is this legal precedent that you're talking about? What? Why are they significant to me? Like, why does that matter? Why? Why do I turn on the news and I hear about these cases? And how would that directly affect me? Right. What's important about the Supreme Court in general and why their, um, you know, decisions are so important is because they are the highest court in the land. You know, when you have appealed a case to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court agrees to hear your case, that, you can't appeal it further than that. So what happened with Roe v. Wade, at that time, abortion was severely restricted. It was completely illegal in a lot of places, a lot of states, a lot of areas. We hear stories from people who had friends who had to receive or perform receive illegal abortions, how it was incredibly unsafe, really sketchy in some ways. And so what Roe v. Wade did is that it challenged that. And Roe v. Wade was decided from a privacy perspective. So the right to abortion is, you know, your right by the Fifth Amendment, but still gave room for states to restrict it in the second and third trimesters. But what Roe did is that the right to abortion was protected, so it states couldn't ban it. And so now, with what Kenya was talking about, like Amendment 2 and stuff, there's a bunch of states who have passed what are known as trigger laws, which are laws that, you know, protect the sanctity of unborn children or something like that. And if Roe is overturned, then those laws go into effect and abortion is completely outlawed. And the laws have various levels, as all (laughs) abortion restrictions do. People, a lot of states also have pre-row bans on the books. So the only reasons they aren't in in effect is because Roe protects the nationwide right to an abortion that, you know, could create criminal penalties for abortion providers. So Roe is like the basic case that everybody is familiar with because that's from 1973 That's what really opened up abortion rights throughout the country. People aren't as familiar with Planned Parenthood versus Casey because 
the majority of people that I encounter, who I talk to, who find out about what I do and want to understand, you know, the landscape of abortion more, they don't even realize how restricted it is or, you know, what the landscape is at all. So they don't necessarily realize that Roe wasn't the end. It's been, you know, (laughs) it's been legislated. It's been gone through the courts in various courts for decades since then. And another aspect of this, both from a legal and judicial perspective, is that there is this budget rider called the Hyde Amendment, which was passed in 1976 and has been reapproved every single year since then. And the Hyde Amendment prohibits federal funding from going toward abortion, which affects, of course, Title X funding, but it also affects anybody on federal insurance, whether that's military insurance, Medicaid, you know, Indian Health Services, they cannot use their insurance to get an abortion. And there have been Supreme Court cases about this as well, most famously the Harris versus McRae decision, which upheld the Hyde Amendment. And in a bunch of states, you know, they have passed their own laws saying Medicaid can cover abortion in our state. But then a lot of states also have gone the opposite way and said, They have their own Hyde Amendments, you know, for their state level, or they say no insurances on the ACA marketplace can provide abortion or cover abortion. And there is the Each Woman Act in the House and Senate that has been introduced many years in a row that would repeal the Hyde Amendment. But I think that's also important to know because we've seen conservatives over and over again use abortion as a talking point to, like, want want to defund Planned Parenthood. But like you were saying earlier, that would just be defunding all the other services that Planned Parenthood provides because abortion is already prohibited. But that law, that budget writer as well, disproportionately impacts low-income people, Black people, people of color who disproportionately depend on these um, federal insurances. You're laying out that legal precedent well, okay? It's easy for me to understand. I know our listeners are like, wow, okay, she's dropping knowledge, and she's what? (laughs) A sister? How sad stays. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) I'm like, you're checking off my boxes. Like, as I'm going through my notes and my outline, I'm like, okay, well, she said that, she said that. (laughs) She's doing fabulous, answering all of these really hard questions. So I just want to say we really appreciate you coming on and having this conversation with us and just discussing in depth all of these really complex topics. And so with that, I want to get to our next question and ask you to just explain why the attack of reproductive rights is a healthcare concern. I know she touched on it earlier, saying about the legal precedent that it would limit a lot of social programming and healthcare programming nationwide, but if you could just elaborate on how that is a healthcare concern and how we should frame reproductive rights and reproductive health as healthcare. Absolutely. Part of the reason that access to reproductive health care is so abysmal in this country, not just abortion, but also, you know, birth control, STI testing, even prenatal care and things like that is because there has been a deliberate attempt to other it and, in many cases, a deliberate exclusion of it from health systems and even, you know, med school curricula. This summer, there was a case at the Supreme Court about whether the birth control mandate of the ACA was constitutional, and it was determined that employers and institutions can, you know, waive that mandate if they have moral objections to birth control. And a big reason that abortion clinics are their own separate clinics is because a lot of hospital networks, especially religious hospitals, refuse to perform abortion care. And there are laws in some states restricting where abortions can be provided and also how many abortions a doctor can even provide in a certain year. We've talked a lot about how internationally and domestically clinics that provide reproductive health care can lose funding if they don't follow specific guidelines that further exclude abortion. I have a really good friend who goes to UAB med school, and it's one of the best med schools in the country, 
but we both learned about how to perform a basic surgical abortion using a papaya in an optional workshop that was held on a Wednesday night by an organization that is basically med students for choice, but they're not allowed to be called that, even though UAB has their own, you know, med students for life-esque chapter. And a lot of med schools are not required to perform teach how to perform abortion care. And a lot of med students will never learn that skill unless they seek it out. So they could go their whole careers without that knowledge. And even at that workshop, I remember there were some people who were interested in OBGYN and they had not even thought of, you know, abortion as part of something in that wheelhouse. Relatedly, I often use like for my Zoom backgrounds, I I have a lot of abortion memes saved. And so I like to use those as Zoom backgrounds, drop a little knowledge, abortion positivity. And one of the most common messages on these memes is abortion is healthcare, or even abortion is essential healthcare. And I had someone message me during an abortion related event. And she said, wow, I had never thought of abortion as healthcare in that way. But I think that calling it essential healthcare is just a bit too far. And healthcare access in general is a reproductive justice issue, because reproductive justice is all about having the full right to exercise bodily autonomy, and make the best decisions for your life, families, and communities, including the decisions of if, when, how to parent. And I believe that anybody should be able to access an abortion legally and for free at any point in pregnancy without shame. And it's important to, you know, think of reproductive health care as health care because those kinds of access to STI testing, prenatal care, abortions, birth control is all about that bodily autonomy that we all strive for. I think that your point on them not even allowing a class or a choir class on the procedure of what an abortion is, is another way that they're limiting that freedom for people. Because if we have healthcare providers who don't know how to do this procedure, then that obviously is going to subsequently provide this action that people are not allowed to have abortions. There's not going to be access to it because there's going to be a lack of healthcare providers who can do it safely and know what they're actually doing. I think also an overall just human right perspective on this is that doing this also takes rights away from so many people. And it also sets its own precedent in itself that the government has the power to tell women yet again what to do with their body. And so we see America going back in time that we keep saying that, oh, it's an agenda. Um, Republicans and conservative ideas are going to push us forward and there's, they're going to bring us into the new world. And it's funny because we're going back to when we were telling women how to dress, how to speak, how to do things. And so now we've gotten to the point where now I'm saying that you don't even have a choice to basically take your health into your, you know, to, re- to claim that power and say, I can't accept that responsibility right now, that maybe I was raped or maybe I, you know, maybe it wasn't something that I wanted to do. And now that I'm pregnant, I don't even have that choice to abort the child. But now in the long run, say that I put that child into foster care. Now we have society taking care of children that, that nobody at this point, there's no social program to support them. Foster care is already, even in 2020 right now, not where it should be. These kids are not getting what they're needed. But we think that it's fine when to take away a service that can prevent all these negative implications and all and, and all of these negative problems from happening in our world and happening right under our noses. We have the power to change that. But we also have the power to give that choice to the women who have to carry these children for nine months and also have to deal with them for the next 18 years of their life. And some women also have the knowledge to know that I I can't do this right now because some of these women are girls. Some of these people are 
are 16 years old. They don't even know anything about themselves. They haven't even had time to explore who they are in life. And so we're stripping them away from, you know, just growing organically as a human and forcing them to grow up. It's important to also mention that women aren't the only people having this problem, right? It is people in general that are having this issue. People as a whole, whether women or non-binary, however you identify, are having this issue where they don't have bodily autonomy, as she said. So I don't know why there isn't more of a sense of urgency with American citizens, I feel like people like you, Helmi, like me and she obviously have a heightened sense of urgency, but this type of podcast and this conversation is something that I want to convey a heightened sense of urgency to the masses. This is something that we all need to be championing. This is something that we all need to be talking about and having deep conversations with each other about. And once we get that consensus, on how we feel on this issue, it'll be easier for us to unite and move forward and create legislation, legal precedent that represents what we want to see. So another question um, that I have for you, you know, I just assume that, you know, you keep up with the news because obviously you're a beautiful intellectual and a sister (laughs) of substance. So of course you'd be watching the news. So how do you, how impactful is the language about packing the court versus expanding the court? I feel like this has been a ginormous issue and voting experts have been saying increasingly so, especially in the wake of ACB's confirmation that it's really important for Democrats to expand the court if they take back the Senate, because it's just the conservative majorities have been so entrenched and so solidified that it would be really hard to, you know, make any progress is kind of the message that I've been getting and understanding from what I've been reading. I think that it goes back to, for me, the biggest thing is it goes back to how hundreds and hundreds of judges Trump has already confirmed and the Senate has already confirmed that are super conservative. A lot of them have been rated incompetent by the American Bar Association. They have basically no experience. I think it also goes back to how a lot of the times with Republicans, it's not, it's, it doesn't have to do with sense. It doesn't have to do with common sense. It doesn't have to do with, you know, independent thinking. It has to do with power because all these vacancies existed during the Obama administration. But like y'all said, they created this McConnell rule and said, we aren't going to vote because there's an election. ACB was nominated and confirmed to a seat on the seventh circuit that was reserved for Judge Myra Selby, who was a black woman, you know, that Obama had appointed all these people, but the Republican Senate refused to confirm any of them. And then we get the Trump administration and the Republican is just green, green lighting so many. And I personally agree with expanding the court. There's no specific number of Supreme Court or federal court judges listed in the Constitution. And it's easier to expand the courts in that way than to legislate term limits, which are is what some people and some politicians are suggesting. And I agree that it's imperative for the Democrats when they take back the Senate and hopefully the presidency to expand the courts so that when these, for example, these abortion bans come to the higher courts, it's not a given that they will lose. That's another reason that you see sometimes, you know, for example, I live in Missouri and sometimes abortion restrictions that are passed here are not necessarily appealed because if the circuit courts near that place are too conservative and you think that you're going to lose, you don't want to take that chance and create that precedent. So by expanding these courts, by expanding the Supreme Court, you can bring some balance of power. You can make it a little less partisan. You can kind of avoid this decimation of rights. We've seen in the past couple months how these lower courts and the Supreme Court have already 
green lighted all these voter suppression tactics, even in Alabama. The Supreme Court is part of the reason the Voting Rights Act is so much weakened. So, yeah, I think that packing the courts is often used in a stigmatizing way. But it's I agree that if there are vacancies, we should be appointing people who agree with us, who agree with the right to bodily autonomy, who agree that everybody deserves the right to vote. Everybody deserves the right to health care, what have you. Everybody who deserves to have their indigenous treaties respected. All kinds of issues are on the line that people don't necessarily think about. I completely agree with that. And I just wanted to touch on one of the things that you talked about with Mitch McConnell and how he was blocking the appointees during the Obama administration and how there was a whole conversation with Trump as well when this was going on. And Mitch McConnell said that you can count on me. I'm as strong as mule piss. That was a direct quote from McConnell as to how he was going to strategically block several appointees under Obama's administration, not even within the year of an election, but the administration over four years as a whole. And so that led to 216, at least 216 nominations of Trump to the federal circuit and to the court of appeals, which is drastically different from the number that Obama um, nominated to these same courts. He, I think he only nominated like 140 something people. Also, along with that, I just wanted to talk about how packing the court is definitely a Republican framing. It has never been referred to packing. It has never been referred to that way until recent years by Republicans and by conservatives to draw a negative connotation towards expanding the court, which is what we should really be calling it. Now, I've heard a lot of arguments about expanding the court and that if we create the legislation in order to expand it under democratic rule, that in turn, it'll create a more hostile environment to where if Republicans were to ever get any sort of majority, they would act more aggressively than they have before. And this has been insinuated by Trump. It's been insinuated by his administration and Mitch McConnell as well. And I also wanted to touch on this. I think it's like what you're saying is I agree with both of you, but I also could feel for you where it's actually scary to actually be behind expanding the court because once Democrats set that president, you know that Republicans, like I was saying earlier, are going to run with it and just do what they want. So as soon as they get an ounce of power, as soon as they, you know, get anybody in, that's what you're going to see. So is it that the next time we see a presidential election and say that Republicans win, are they just going to automatically you know, so-called expand the court and that it'd be fine? Because I definitely saw, um, a video clip on CNN where Trump was like, oh, the Democrats are trying to pack the court. So why don't we do it ourselves? So it's like, basically what you're saying is because you know, you only have four more years, even if you did get elected, you would only have four more years to actually like set a president or actually do something during your term. You would make sure you, you actually pack the court with a bunch of conservative judges so that, Democrats would, even if they did have the um, House and they had the presidency or the they had the president, then they wouldn't have the Supreme Court. And that's going to block a lot of, you know, legislation because they have a lot of power. And so I think that a lot of people have to also see how that's also scary in itself. So is that something that we definitely want to be behind? And I just want to move on to our next question and talk about the Affordable Care Act. Tell me, what are the reasons for Amy Coney Barrett wanting to overturn this? And how will Americans be affected by repeal? Repealing the ACA has been one of the Trump administration's stated objectives ever since they gained power. They've had various aspects of it under attack in the courts, including the individual mandate And now the Supreme Court could rule on whether the whole policy in whole or in part is unconstitutional. And it's really important 
that it is not repealed because millions of people would lose their health insurance coverage. It's obviously not perfect, and I would personally prefer if the United States adopted a more universal health care system, but I have many friends share about how the care they have been afforded through the ACA has saved their life. From a repro perspective, the ACA has been significantly weakened over the past several years. I mentioned that Supreme Court mandate that, uh, or Supreme Court decision, excuse me, that the birth control mandate is not applicable to employers or institutions or organizations that oppose birth control for religious or moral reasons. And, you know, we have the Hyde Amendment, which prevents federal insurances. We have the state's applying their own ACA marketplace restrictions. So it's just, it's a way that so many are able to access healthcare services at lower cost than they would if it, if they were uninsured. I have personally been uninsured before and also been working jobs that only pay $10 an hour, $15 an hour, And I have multiple chronic illnesses and have had to make the choice about, okay, am I going to pay for my prescriptions this month or am I going to pay for food this week? Or, okay, I am having this symptom of a flare-up, but is it worth going to urgent care because it would be so expensive and it would be such a dent in in my budget? And no one should have to make those decisions. And the ACA makes healthcare that much more accessible for millions of people. And another thing about this is that Trump has always said, I'm going to repeal the ACA and put up my own plan. But that plan has never been introduced. So it's just important that we take back the Senate and the ha- keep the House and um, take back the presidency so that, you know, we can make legislative advances regarding health care. If the ACA is repealed, then let's find something else that works that still is within whatever confines or restrictions the Supreme Court puts up. I think also the wording of those decisions will be really important. From my understanding, with the ACA unconstitutionality debate with the individual mandate, it was kind of about you can't force people to be on health insurance. With the birth control mandate, it was all about moral and religious objections. But it's just, to me, healthcare is such a human right. And millions of people are still in that gap. They can't afford things on the ACA marketplace. They can't qualify for medical insurance. I've been in Missouri. I've been in Alabama, both states. I worked really hard on Medicaid expansion. We finally got it passed here in Missouri. In Alabama, the GOP is not ready to pass it yet. No one deserves to be in that gap that I was in. And I know that there are so many people who are even more worse off. And taking away the ACA is taking away just a really important resource for millions of people. Right. And especially what a lot of our listeners are going to be. It takes a lot of access away from college age people. And along with that, just recognizing the fact that red states are the ones who are usually taking the most amount of money money for federal social programming. So it's kind of contradictory if you're over here and you're legislating to take away or draw back social programming and things like Medicare and are fighting against the expansion of Medicare and Medicaid, yet you turn around and you're needing the same funding in order to help people of low socioeconomic status in your own state because you're not giving them the programming that they need to elevate themselves up or pull themselves up by the metaphorical bootstraps. So um, that's an important thing that I think needs to be mentioned as well, because I know the ACA helped me stay on to my parents' insurance plan, because I'm not going to lie, I am coming out of college, but I cannot afford insurance right now. Um, I don't have a salary job, so that's not something that I'm going to be able to afford probably for the next six to 10 months. 
it's important for people to realize the sheer impact that the ACA had on keeping people on their parents' insurance programs and also helping people with pre-existing programs. It just helped through a range of healthcare issues. I definitely agree because I know for me, I also graduate in December, but I'm also 22. So I'll be 23, you know, this year, which means technically after my birthday, I would not have health insurance if, you know, Trump is gets in office and repeals the um, Affordable Care Act because prior to Affordable Care Act, it had the 23 and then you got kicked off. But now right now it's 26 because a lot of people go to master's programs, you know, a lot of people, but even that you're 23 years old, you're still, you know, figuring out life. For a lot of people, you're coming out of your undergrad, you're probably going to get an entry-level job. But at this point, a lot of people are fighting for the in- these entry-level jobs. So a lot of people are getting out of college and going to, you know, work at places that don't have the best, you know, health insurance or don't have benefits, you know, for them. But then you also have some people who, you're in your 20s, you're still figuring out life. We all don't mature the same. We all have different you know, life experiences and we're all in put in different situations and we're not all able to get that insurance. And I think that is so scary. But I know you touched on a little bit how that could in, impact your, uh, has impacted you personally, but can you also give us a little context on how this would impact you, your work and like what you've been doing? I'm not going to lie to you. When ACB's confirmation happened that night I certainly felt really bad but uh, repro activists have been preparing for this moment for years abortion funds practical support organizations advocacy organizations have already been providing financial and practical support for abortion seekers for decades have already been lobbying legislators either to pass legislation that protects abortion access in more progressive states and oppose restrictions in more conservative states. The first thing I did, I had created, in preparation for June versus Russo, these kind of master posts about, hey, these are the best places to donate or volunteer, or here's how to look up organizations in your area. Those posts have gotten hundreds of thousands of views and engagement since then, which really makes me feel good because I feel like raising awareness is one of my strengths and one of the th- my biggest skills and one of the ways I can use my experience to help others. And since I moved to St. Louis in 2019, I haven't been able to be involved in the RJ community in exactly the same ways, but I am a clinic escort and I am a canvasser and being an activist is integral to my identity. And so I feel like my role is, you know, raising awareness, helping people get connected to resources, helping people better understand the current landscape participating in local, statewide, and national advocacy efforts, bust abortion stigma whenever I can. I just think that no matter somebody's skill set or schedule or level of resources, there is always something that they can do. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. I know that whenever, you know, abortion ban makes the news or ACB's confirmation happens, something like that, A lot of people just immediately jump to posting, hey, if you live in a state where it's banned, just call me and I'll drive you to my state. I don't mind getting arrested or stuff like that. That is dangerous and completely unnecessary. It's way better to find the people, the activists, the organizations in your area who have already been doing this work and find out how to support them. Don't go stockpile plan B because you're not going to need that much of it, and then the people who actually need it won't be able to go to CVS and find it on the shelves. Reach out to your local abortion fund or abortion clinic, which the majority of abortion clinics are independent and would love your donations anyways, and see, hey, is there anything I can buy for you? There's just so many ways to help, and I feel like as a repro activist, we're constantly in crisis mode. So when crises happen, it feels really bad, 
but we are constantly preparing for this, constantly thinking about the next step, the worst case scenario. In some ways, it's a really awesome community to be a part of because they all share my vision for a better world, a world where reproductive justice is achieved. Some people, at least my inner circle and my closest friends, share the belief that, you know, being kind to ourselves and others is the most radical, important thing that we can do, that we all have the potential to enact positive change. And I feel really passionate about, you know, creating an environment where people see that in themselves and welcoming them into the fold and motivating and mobilizing others. There's always going to be a zillion trap laws to fight Um, There's always going to be obstacles to try and navigate or overcome, but there's something that each of us can do to try and make it easier for the, you know, an abortion seeker in our area or even somewhere in the United States, they can sleep a little easier. And you wrapped that up so beautifully. It sounded so lovely the way she wrapped it up in a minute. I was like, okay, okay. Well, Helmy, do you have any additional comments or anything else that you want to say um, regarding this conversation as a whole? No, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to kind of talk about one of my absolute favorite subjects. Yeah, if anybody ever wants to reach me, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Helmsinki. <laughs> I'm happy to, you know, when people DM me, they say, I'm from this place, what can I do? Or I'm interested in this specific niche cause how can I help I love plugging people in and I hope that everybody listening realizes their power their ability to enact positive change and whether it's abortion whether it's something else they feel motivated to go out and you know achieve justice in that in that area I feel it. I feel it. Well, thank you so much for coming on to This Is Black Focus and Open Discussion. I really appreciate you coming on so much. You are our first participant, so we just need to snap it up again, okay, for her helping us work through this whole thing, okay? It's fine. But thank you again so much for engaging in this conversation with us. Thank you for joining This Is Black Focus for another open discussion. We hope you enjoyed today's dialogue and encourage you to engage in the conversation by following our Instagram at This Is Black Focus and our Twitter at We Are Black Focus. Here you will find updates for future podcast conversations and even be able to give input on what they are. For business inquiries, feel free to email us at blackfocuscollective at gmail.com and tune in every week for a new episode.